Today we're going to talk about baptism from uh, St. Cyril's uh, work, but also some other things. So let's just start with some basic things. Okay, so what is baptism? Pretty simple, huh? Mm -hmm. What's baptism? Uh, an immersion. Okay, immersion, yes it is. That's what the Greek said, baptizo, to immerse. Baptizo is to immerse, exactly. All right. So it's not like just throwing water on a person's head or sprinkling them or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. Good little hokey pokey. Turn yourself around. Yeah. Do the hokey pokey, right, exactly. Exactly. So that's, um, that's what baptism is. And uh, who initiated baptism? Oh, okay, you could say that, but what was his baptism of? Uh, it was of water, yeah. Right? Repentance? It was of repentance. It was of repentance. So, it was of repentance. And what is... Could you ask the people to be quiet over there? Just say, hey, you guys stop. Hey, get out of here. You gotta be quiet right here. You gotta go to the other. No, 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 this room is getting less and less convenient because of, uh, because of all the noise. I, I did publish uh, one of the catechesis things. Uh, I had to compress it and such, and there's a lot of noise, but you can hear it, but boy, you can sure hear a lot of other stuff, too. You can hear a lot of other stuff. Okay, so his, his was a baptism of repentance. So what's Christian baptism? So what, 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 what word association would you do with baptism, the Christian baptism? The Spirit. Oh, okay, water in the Spirit, okay. Was St. John's baptism of water in the Spirit? No, no, it wasn't. It was, a, it was for remission of sins, but it was temporary, wasn't it? Like taking a bath. When you take a bath, you get clean, but eventually you get dirty again, right? So that's what St. John's baptism was. It was, his baptism was one where people were making an open repentance and a change of life, which is good, but it was largely symbolic, right? Which is basically what a lot of uh, Protestant baptisms are. He's, he's knocking that thing in. We gotta keep his body away from that as much as we can. <laughs> so we'll see if that works. So, <coughs> baptism of water and the spirit. What else is that baptism of? What other words would you use associated with baptism? Death and resurrection. Death and resurrection. Why is that? Kind of going back to the form of baptism that we observe in the three immersions, Christ spent three days in the tomb. Okay, three immersions, right? Okay. And then what happens when you come out of the water? You're in the water. Yes. You're a new creature, right? Mm -hmm. That's what St. Paul says, right? Not circumcision or uncircumcision or any other thing, but a new creature. We become a new creature. What is new about us? You suddenly able to dunk or play the piano? What's new about you? You've been joined to the body of Christ. You've been joined to the body of Christ. Okay. What what makes what's new about that? What's the significance of that? You're connected to the source of life. Okay. Okay. Before okay. that, you were outside of it. You were outside of it. Right? The Holy Spirit was acting upon us from outside. The Holy Spirit acts upon everybody. Believer, unbeliever, atheist, God hater, God lover. Everybody, the Holy Spirit acts upon everybody, every man. But from the outside until baptism of water and the Spirit. Then the Holy Spirit acts inside. We are temples of the Holy Spirit after baptism. A very critical, important thing. So Christian baptism is then very much akin to like when you have a child. You have a child. And well, what do you do? You know, you throw them upside down on couches and you do stuff like that. <laughs> Why do you do that? Well, because you're interacting with him and you're going to teach him so he can be an astronaut someday or whatever, right? And if you didn't interact with him, if you didn't talk to him, if you didn't read him the same storybook 150 times in one day, then, then he wouldn't learn. And his potential would be wasted, right? 
so baptism is the enabling of us to become perfected. It isn't the perfection. It's the enabling of us to be perfected. Just like he is not an adult. Can't drive a car. Doesn't even know his numbers yet, right? But he has the potential to do all those things. If he's trained, he has the potential to do all those things. So that's what baptism is. Baptism is giving us the, not just the potential, but the, it's really, well, it's what we were born for. So you could call it potential, but I'd say a little stronger word than potential. I would say it's a, it's a man, our manifest destiny, what we are predestined to, unless we gum it up, unless we, we mess it up, right? So that's what baptism is. Let's see. I read this like two or three times, and I, I wasn't satisfied with how my notes were. So let's see what we're going to do here. So we'll, we'll cover Romans 6 probably in detail. I don't know if we'll do it today, but I want you, I want you to definitely... That's the quintessential text on baptism in the scriptures is Romans 6. And we'll cover it from beginning to end, basically. Okay. With St. John, let's just go back to St. John's baptism. What did he mean when he's saying, make straight the way of the Lord? Right? Prepare you the way of the Lord, make its path straight. What's he talking about? Um, well, a lot of St. John's um, disciples were transferred over to Christ, right? After. That's true, yeah. Andrew and Philip. So he kind of he kind of gave them some of his first uh, loyal followers. Okay, but, what, but he was saying, prepare you the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Saying that to all of us, okay. right to everybody. What was he saying? What was he meaning by that? Prepare you the way of the Lord, make his path straight. That's a quote from Isaiah, I believe, isn't it? Mm -hmm. right? Yes. Because he's the forerunner is prophesied, and then the prophet comes, who's prophesied, right? So he was prophesied, and then he gave prophecies. By the way, all of St. John's prophecies were fulfilled. Some prophets, their, pro their prophecies still are waiting. All of his prophecies, he was the last prophet of the Old Testament. You could argue that he was the second to the last prophet, because Jesus died after him. And Jesus is also a prophet, right? He's prophet, king, and uh, also uh, prophet, king, and why am I fitting in the other one? Uh, I don't well, um, gold, frankincense, and milk. He's going to die. It's, anyway, I'm off on a track, a tangent here. So, St. John's baptism was of repentance, and we are to make his path straight. We still haven't understood what making his path straight are. Do you remember Richard Nixon? Some of you weren't even, maybe even born, or you're still. You know, my, my, memory just, my memory only just goes back to I, I smoke but I did not inhale. Uh, no, he didn't say that. What he I said was, I am, I am not a crook. I am not a crook. <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, what does that word crook mean? Crooked. Crooked. Which means, in popular usage, a human, right? When ways that are crooked are, are ways that are criminal or, or sinful. So we say, make his path straight. In other words, the purpose of baptism is to, to be enabled then to repent of all of your sins and to become straight, right? To have straight paths. So baptism, uh, people think about baptism in such a, uh, I don't know, a very informal way. There's nothing informal about baptism. Baptism is like the, the whole critical part of your life. If you were to say, what's the most important thing that ever happened to me in your life? And you, you know, you've gotten married, you've gone to the moon, you were the first person to land on Mars, you, uh, you won the Nobel Peace Prize, etc., etc. The most important thing that could happen to any human being is to be baptized. Because then you have the, the eternal life opened up unto you, right? That's the most critically important thing that can happen to you, is to be baptized, is to be a Christian, okay? So, 
we still should be listening to St. John's voice about baptism. His baptism was inferior to Christian baptism because it was only a baptism of repentance. Christian baptism is a baptism not only of repentance, because there is repentance. It's of actual change. It's actually making a substantive change in you. You are a different human being after you come out of the water. After you're buried, you rise again, alive again, and as a new creature. And that's a big deal. That's why it's so critical to do baptism correctly because the symbolism is pretty much lost when you just drip a little water on somebody or sprinkle a little water, pour water over their head or something. Baptism is to immerse. And that's, it's important to do things correctly. And I'll continue to rant about things like this, that if we have bad practices, bad, theolo bad uh, liturgical practices, they will morph into bad theology. And then the bad theology will assist bad morality and it'll be a snake eating its tail. Bad morality leads to bad liturgical practices and theology, and then those lead to more immorality. So we are seeing now in orthodoxy, we've seen it already in some of the so-called mainline you know, Protestant denominations. They're, they're unrecognizable to what your grandparents knew. Unrecognizable. They're just a, a shadow of what they were before. And the immorality, the the strange theology is just increasing and increasing, and we shouldn't think that we are immune to such things. We're not immune to such things. If we don't live a righteous life and struggle, then we just take in that tainted air and start to change. Some of you, most of you know that I, I did a sermon on Pentecost that was uh, you know epic, 42 minutes long. Um, my wife, I said, what did you think of the sermon? And all she told me was, I, I think it was too long. That's all she said. <laughs> so hopefully not all of you had the same opinion. So in the midst of that sermon, in context, I talked about Pride Month. And, and it's getting stranger and stranger. Bizarre things are happening. And if we don't live a Christian life with zeal, We'll believe those bizarre things in 10 years, five years, three years, 20 years. We'll just have imbibed the culture and we'll just be just like them. So we really have to live a, a vigorous life after baptism. And I saw that there were there were comments, but there were strange comments that were just hilarious. They, they, anybody who didn't like the message, they couldn't really say anything except I won't listen to a person in a funny hat, or I won't listen to a person who's very looks like a couch, or uh, or here here a man in a dress is talking about gays. Ha ha ha! I mean, but they can't do anything except ad hominem because there's nothing else. They can't say anything else. You know, say you know my way is is my way is the one I is the way I like. You know, reminds me of a, a classic song. What's it called? I think it's called For What It's Worth, isn't it? And it's uh, by uh, Buffalo Springfield. Something happened in here. Oh, Buffalo Springfield. Something happened in here. What it is ain't exactly yeah. clear. No, they go around and they later, he says, uh, carrying sign, uh, something and carrying signs mostly say hooray for our side. <laughs> There's no substance to it. Just hooray for our side, right? It's like, why Why is it okay to be gay? Because I said so, because my idol tell me to say that. Well, we know things are right or wrong because of Christian life and Christian tradition. But there's an awful lot of people walking around being Orthodox that are, they swall they've swallowed it all. They've swallowed the bait. So I don't want you swallowing the bait. You know, I don't want you to think that Christianity is not being part of the LGBTQ. We don't have to find ourselves by what not to be, but we define ourselves by who we should be, and then things like that are obviously a sham and toxic, right? And uh, many other things are a sham and toxic because we have the Holy Spirit within us. So it's really important to have after baptism, and some of you are preparing for baptism. Some of you here have already been baptized, and you just want to continue to be part of these classes, and that's great. I benefit from them myself. 
as I read the material, it helps me. Whenever I hear Father Nicholas teach, it helps me. When I go to a ch children's class and hear them teaching, it benefits me. I think we can benefit from everything and not think of ourselves that we're, we're too smart for anything or too cool for school. So, let's uh, cover, I guess, from um, from the beginning to the end of his, of his sermon here. So, uh, where is that? Location 3671. I don't know what location that is. Um, oh, here it is. Okay. So, uh, I don't know. It's uh, paragraph 3. He says, This is in truth a serious matter, brethren, and you must approach it with good heed. Each one of you is about to be presented to God before thousands of angelic hosts. The Holy Spirit is about to seal your souls. You are to be enrolled in the army of the great king. Therefore, make you ready and equip yourselves, putting on, I mean, not bright apparel, but piety of soul and good conscience. So I highlighted that because we actually are in the presence of the entire church when we're baptized. There is a bad practice of baptism, especially for children. I never do it but some of the bigger institutional churches will do it, that it's by invitation only, and it's a big shindig, right? You have the baptism, and then you have a big party afterwards. It's not even part of divine liturgy. And that's wrong. Baptism is a public event. As much as we can, it should be a public event. And you're not only in front of everybody, you're in front of the whole angelic hosts and all of the saints. Everybody's present in the baptism. So that's pretty amazing when you think about it. It's, it's, uh, yeah. I've been in prisons baptizing people with a fan running so loud you could hardly hear yourself think and with it 100 degrees inside and sweat just pouring off our bodies. And all the saints and angels were there. They are probably more comfortable than us. But... Uh, no matter where you go, no matter how humble the circumstances, the whole church is with you. Then he goes on to say, Regard not the labor as simple water, but rather regard the spiritual grace that is given with the water. For just as offerings brought to the heathen author, uh, altars, though simple in nature, become defiled by the invocation of idols, so contrarywise, the simple water, having received the invocation of the Holy Spirit and of Christ and of the Father, acquires a new power of holiness. We believe. We know. When I say believe, you know, that word sometimes is a little ambiguous. We know. Like I believe in gravity? Yeah, okay. We kind of know gravity exists, right? Kind of know if you throw a ball, it's going to fall down to the ground. That's the kind of belief I'm talking about. We believe that God can imbue any, any item he wants with grace, the bones of saints, even St. Saint Peter's shadow. In the Old Testament, people were healed by being in his shadow as he walked. And... Also, uh, holy icons and water. Water is, of course, well, it's the stuff of life. Without water, there would be no life. The most unique compound in the world. So common, and yet it's very unique. If you know much about chemistry, it's really a freaky compound. It's amazing. And, of course, we're mostly water. Our blood is mostly water. Without water, there is no life. And in the Old Testament, water was constantly a theme. The, the Jews went across the water, dry shot actually. So there was a wall of water on one side and on the other, which is like baptism, right? Because they were passing through the water. And they escaped from the Egyptians. And there's many other occurrences of water in the Old Testament. And they're pointing towards baptism. So we do believe this. People might think, well, you're just, you know, quaint and a little country church. Uh, let's be a little country church. Let's not be like these uh, people who think they're intelligent, but they're actually fools. When you bless the water, the demons are cast out of it. If there's any demons in the water, they're cast out. Demons sometimes do live in water. They live in the water, they live in the air. And you cast out the demons from the water, and purify it, and the Holy Spirit blesses the water so that it can do what mere water can cannot normally do. You take water out of the tap and you don't bless it, I suppose under extremists you could do a baptism. But we, uh, just normal water is, is not holy. When we bless the water, then it becomes capable of imparting eternal life to us. So what's happening in baptism is a symbol 
and actual. And remember that. It's not just it's not just a symbol, it is actual. There's something actually happening. The water is actually changing. Now you can't prove that the water is different by any scientific test. Although people have blessed holy water, uh, water to make holy water and and drank drunk it twenty years later and it's been fresh as the first day that they, they blessed it. So what we're doing is not just quaint. It's not just liturgical custom. By the way, in the catechumen prayers, do you know why I breathe on you in the catechumen prayers? Do you know why? In the fourth exorcism, I actually breathe on you three times, and I make the sign of the cross on you three times. What does the breathing mean? What's the Greek word for breath? Zeus. Uh, no, not pneuma. 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 Zeus. Right? And we also refer to the Holy Spirit as breath. Right? So we're breathing upon a person, invoking the Holy Spirit to bless them. Jesus did that on the day of his resurrection, didn't he? He came into the upper room and he breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. They didn't receive the Holy Spirit at that point. It was going to happen how many days later? 10. 40. No, 50. <laughs> That's good, 50. Because <laughs> it was the day of resurrection. Yeah, right, right. No, I was thinking of ascension. No, yeah. Yeah. But. Well, he promised the Holy Spirit to them on ascension too. Right. But he breathed on them on the day of the resurrection. Okay? So, let's read some more from St. Cyril. By the way, do you find St. Cyril easy to read, difficult to read, in the middle, interesting, boring? Interesting. 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 I find her to be kind of in the middle. In the middle, I'd say. Yeah. It's in the middle. Yeah. In the middle. Everybody's in the middle. Okay. He's, he's very prosaic. He is prosaic. Well, that's partially the translator, but yeah. Remember that this was this was TV back then, right? This was this was what people went to. They went to lectures and, and, and homilies. St. John Chrysostom actually was always mad when they would applaud. He didn't like it. Mm -hmm. And my bishop does not like applause in church. Don't ever applaud a church around him. He does not like it. And I agree with it. I agree with it. All right. For since man is of twofold nature, body and soul, the purification also is twofold. The one incorporeal for the incorporeal part, the other bodily for the water. The water cleanses the body and the spirit seals the soul. Baptism of water and the spirit. That we may draw near to God, having our hearts sprinkled with the spirit and our body washed with pure water. When going down, therefore, into the water, think not of the bare element, but look for salvation by the power of the Holy Spirit. For without both, thou canst not possibly be made perfect. It is not I that I say this, but the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the power of the matter, he said, except a man be born anew of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Where's that? Where's that? You should know this. What? So the kingdom of God is the church, right? Well, no, where is this quote? Yeah. Oh. Where did he say it? I want chapter and verse. At least I want chapter. I want chapter. I want chapter and verse. You should have brought the reference guy. Uh, Come on, this is easy. Yeah. This is easy stuff. It's talking in Nicodemus. Yeah. That's it. So John it's chapter 3. Exactly. It's very important. If you didn't know that, then I would just in an ancient way tell you that you need to, you know, you need to read the scripture more. Some things should just be obvious to us. We should know things like that. I don't know the verse, but I know that it's in John chapter 3. I never remember verses. You know? You know, if you hear a Protestant preacher in Romans 6 and 17, it says, we say, Paul says. <laughs> That's about what we say. Paul says. Once in a while we know it's Romans, you know. But for the most part, we just say Paul says. So, neither doth he that is baptized with water, but not found worthy of the Spirit, receive the grace of perfection. Nor if a man be virtuous in his deeds, but not receive the seal of water, he shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And he says, a bold saying, but not mine. For it is Jesus Christ who declared it. You must be baptized of water and the Spirit, right? 
So our body is washed and our, and our soul is washed by baptism. All right. So there's, he goes into a lots of stuff about why it is that grace is given by water and not a different element. That's interesting, but it, it, it brings us a little far afield. You know, we can't, we can't look at everything. But uh, it is interesting. I, I hope you guys read it carefully. In chapter, uh, paragraph 6, it says, Baptism is the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New. And John, of course, was the one that brought this brought the baptism to the forefront and then of course Jesus was baptized by John. Why was he baptized by John? Um, sanctify the water. Yeah, sanctify the water. Did he need to be baptized by John? No, but the water is a baptism needed Jesus. The Jesus. Yes, exactly. So John didn't want to baptize him, right? Because John was humble. And John saw the Lord and said, I need to be baptized by you. So what did Jesus tell him when he said, I need to be baptized by you? Basically, this has to happen so that yeah. it can be fulfilled. Let it, to be, let it be so to fulfill all righteousness. Right? So what does he mean by that? Let it be to fulfill all righteousness. Uh, to fulfill the old law. Well, not to fulfill the old law. What's the righteousness he's referring to? You guys, not himself, he's already righteous. He's saying he wants to be baptized to trans, to make water changed so that he can impart perfection to us. So that we can become new creatures when we are dipped into the font and then be capable of becoming perfected. That's the righteousness he's talking about. To fulfill all righteousness. Mm -hmm. He had no need to do it. By the way, you might not know this, or maybe you do, that when he was baptized, the Jordan turned back. The Jordan went the opposite direction. The rivers went uh, stopped, just like uh, in the Red Sea, or also when they crossed the Jordan. I've also heard that happens sometimes in with African missions. Sometimes when they're baptizing people, the water will stop. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I've heard that the Jordan sometimes turns back, or maybe every day turns back on, on theophany. Also, it, you know, even to this day. But the, the very nature of water was changed. So it showed a change by water that's going downhill in a river stops, which of course, water doesn't do that. Right? Okay. So there's, there's a lot of things about St. John, but let's go to some other things because um, we only have so much time. So, on paragraph 8, it says, he's talking about, he's talking about St. John's preaching, and then he says, what then must you do? What are the fruits of repentance? Because he told them to have the fruits of repentance. And if there's a tree that is that does not bring good fruit, is the tree is hewn down, right? And cast into the fire. Which means if you're baptized and you don't bear good fruit, you're going to be cut down and cast into the fire. Baptism is not automatic salvation. Baptism is enabling you to become perfect. And then you live in the Christian way with repentance. And you do a terrible job of it. But God, by His grace, supplies the ability and supplies uh, the, the perfection. So you do an infinite number, I say, of perf imperfect things, and God says, okay, I'll take that as perfection because of your desire, because of your effort, right? So, so he, gave me a, he gave me a little scribble that he is very proud of, so I'm going to put it on my refrigerator. To him, it's a work of art, isn't it? Huh? It's a work of art to him. It's very special. So, because especially gave it to me. So our work is, is like that. We were little scribbles on paper, right? But God will make it into a, a work of art. So don't lose, don't lose, um, don't lose uh, courage about this. In fact, here he's about to tell you something. So he says, uh, let him that has two coats, give to him hath none. 
and the teacher is worthy of credit since he was also the first to practice what he taught. He was not ashamed to speak, for conscience hindered not his tongue that he had meat. Let him do likewise. Wouldst thou enjoy the grace of the Holy Spirit, yet judges the poor not worthy of bodily food? Seekest thou the greatest gifts, and not impart the small? So we're Christian. Everything's important. Spiritual things are important, but everything's spiritual. If you do everything in a spiritual way, then everything's spiritual. Whether it be giving food to someone, or comfort to someone, or whatever it is. Though thou be a publican or a fornicator, have hope of salvation. The publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. Paul also is a witness, saying, Neither fornicators nor adulterers nor the rest shall inherit the kingdom of God, and such were some of you. But ye are washed and ye are sanctified. He said not such are some of you, but such were some of you. Sin committed in the state of ignorance is pardoned, but persistent, persistent wickedness is condemned. We live in an age now, I'll say things delicately, now we live in an age where there's, there's just a certain insanity that's in the air, and I think that when people have a tempestuous youth, it's more tempestuous than your grandfather's youth, and way more content, content, con, what do I tempestuous. say? Tempestuous. 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 Tempestuous than your great and great and great grandfather's youth. People made mistakes in youth, but now we do such strange things that people feel that they can't be forgiven. Maybe one of you has that feeling sometimes. I've done so many bad things. How can I ever be changed? How can I ever really be forgiven? And perhaps some of these bad things that you've done or thought or said, they've weakened you in some way. And so you have residual effects from them. Well, what are you going to do? Well, believe that it's true, fornicators and adulterers will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. But former fornicators, former adulterators, adulterators, adulterers, adulterers, adulterators, <laughs> adulterators of the English language. Okay. I don't know. That might be, I don't know if uh, you can adulterate the English language and get in. <laughs> so the, the former sinners, you can be, you can come into the kingdom of heaven. So don't listen to the voice in your head that says, you know, I did this, I did that. And you might even be dealing with the repercussions of what you did. Well, you changed. Everybody should read the life of St. Mary of Egypt a hundred times. Now you can't be like her. You can't go out in the desert and, and live only on three loaves for years and then just be out in the desert and, and uh, have no food. And it, obviously, we, we don't have that capability. We don't have that strength. And there's not even a desert to go to. Where in the world would you go? But she was aware of her sin. And God cleansed her of it. it took her 17 years. And then she no longer had the desire for these sins. 17 years of fighting. Can you imagine 17 years of fighting laying on the ground when she would start to tremble? 17 years. Can we do 17 minutes? Right? 17 days. But we can we can all be saved. And indeed, God wants you to be saved. God's planning for you to be saved. You just have to just try. Um, I, uh, uh, on a personal note, I, uh, I've got problems with my left hip right now. And it just, sometimes it just hurts like the dickens. It's probably arthritis. And so, I, and I get really demoralized about it. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this guy on the internet called Tom Morrison. He's really kind of cool. And I am amazed at how he is a preacher. He's a preacher for physical fitness. It's like you do a little bit, you know? If you can stretch this much, stretch that much. Don't stretch more than you can stretch. That's okay, you'll get better. And I'm thinking, that's exactly what I tell people. That's exactly what I tell people. It's like now I just have to listen to him like I want you to listen to me, right? And do the little bit of stretching and not try to say, okay, I just want to go and now deadlift a zillion pounds again, or, you know, I, I'm not ready for that because I'll injure myself further. So. A little bit at a time, you know, slow and steady wins the race. The tortoise is the one that wins the race. So just struggle. Your prayer is not so good, 
it'll get better if you struggle. Now, if you don't do anything, well, then you're not going to get better. But if you struggle, you're going to get better. It's guaranteed because of baptism. So, let's see what else I got here. If any man, this is paragraph 10, I hope it, it's the same. I read it from, um, I, I bought it from my Kindle app because it was easier to take notes and everything, but I think it's the same. I think it's the, the same paragraphs. If any man receive not baptism, he hath not salvation, except only martyrs, who even without water receive the kingdom. How does that happen? What do we call that? Baptism by blood. Baptism by blood. Yeah, exactly. But otherwise, baptism is necessary for salvation. Now, can God save somebody without baptism? It's his business. But I, I venture no opinion about that. Wasn't there, was Gregory the baptism of intent? I don't know about that. There was, um, um, when the, he was Pope of Rome for a while, this was when it was part of the Orthodox Church, he said that if someone is intending to be baptized but they die before it happens, it's baptism of intent. That's good enough for me. Yeah. I mean, we should have the attitude about people who are not baptized, people who are not believers, people who are Muslims, people who are atheists, people who are whatever. God will judge them. We pray for them. That's all we do. We don't make any. We don't have to make any prognostications about what happens to them when they die. God is. He's not going to take any advice from us, and He doesn't care about our opinion. So we shouldn't care about our opinion either. Just pray for those people. That's all. You know, be kind to people. Pray for those that you know that have died. Pray for those you know that are in, uh, you know, bad condition right now because of whatever they're doing or not doing and have hope in God that they'll change. So, for when the Savior in redeeming the world by his cross was pierced in the side, he shed forth blood and water that men living in times of peace might be baptized in water and in times of persecution by their own blood. How about that? There's blood and water, right? So, he was crossed, he was on the cross and he, he died, and then the blood and water pooled in his, in his pericardium, right? In the sack around the heart. And then when, he, when the killing stroke was done, basically to make sure that he was dead by the soldier, he pierced his heart and his lung too, and out comes blood and water. So the blood is the baptism in blood, and the water is baptism by water and also some people commentators would say it's the, the two natures of Christ are apparent there right? so these things are not accidental all these things have meaning for martyrdom also the Savior is wont to call baptism saying can you drink the cup which I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with and the martyrs confess being made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men who did he ask can you drink that the cup that I am to be uh, baptized, that I will drink, and baptized with the baptism I am going to be baptized with. Who did who did he talk? Who was he talking to? His disciples. Yes. Would be a little more specific. Two of them. Uh, James and John. James and John. Exactly. They came pretty cheekily, right? Said, "Hey, when you when you come to your in the kingdom, can we sit at your right hand and on your left?" I think they were put up to it by their mother. But that's pretty cheeky. And he, you know, he didn't really, he kind of mildly rebuked them. He said, can you do this? And they said, we can. And he said, well, yeah, you will be able to. You will drink of this baptism of fire, of persecution. Now, we don't know how John died. James was, uh, uh, I don't remember how he died, but he was martyred. I can't remember how he died. Jesus sanctified baptism by being himself baptized. We've already covered that. If the Son of God was baptized, then what godly man is he that despises baptism? Jesus did it. should be good enough for us. Jesus said, take eat, this is my body. Well, we better be doing that. we got a lot of splaining to do if we don't have the Eucharist in our liturgical rites, like so many 
other people that they espouse Christ, but they don't do what he told them. That don't make any sense. So, we will be baptized in following the example of him. But he was baptized not that he might receive remission of sins, for he was sinless, but being sinless, he was baptized to give them that were baptized a divine and excellent grace. For since the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he himself also partook of the same. And having been made partakers of his presence in the flesh, we might be made partakers also of his divine grace. Thus Jesus was baptized, and thereby we gain, uh, again by our participation, we might receive both salvation and honor. So this is just recapitulation of what we said. But you know, uh, when a person learns, they learn something, they forget it, they learn something, they forget it, they learn something, they forget it, and eventually they remember it. So repetition is important. Okay, paragraph 12. For thou goest down into the water bearing thy sins, but the invocation of grace, having sealed thy soul, Suffer thee not afterwards to be swallowed by the terrible dragon. That is, there's no demons in the water. They're cast out. Having gone down dead in sins, I've come a step quickened in righteousness. We die to our sins. Some people would say the old man dies. We rise up a new creature. For thou hast been united with the likeness of the Savior's death, and thou should also be deemed worthy of his resurrection. The likeness of his death is spoken of in Romans 6, and we'll have to cover that all from beginning to end. Maybe next next week we'll do that. I'll see. <clears throat> because that's an important chapter to understand, and also chapter 3 of John. Those two chapters are really what you need to know for baptism. Um, there's other things, but those are the two, the two big ones. So we're, we're go down in the likeness of his death, but he died, we die. He died for sin, for our sins. We die to our sins. And then we rise. He rose from the dead, a perfected human being, and imparted the, the ability for us to become perfected human beings. But we're in the likeness of his resurrection, but this is a little different. The likeness of his death uh, and the likeness of his resurrection are, it, there's a similitude of, of, of uh, that it's the same, but some of it's not. We die for ourselves. You can just die for yourself. You can die for you can't die for anybody else. You can't save anyone else. Jesus died for all of us. So his death was a death for everyone. Your death in baptism is a death for you. And your resurrection is your resurrection. His resurrection is our resurrection. So it's similar, but of course his is so much greater. will be walking again in newness of life from baptism. Moreover, when thou hast been deemed worthy of grace, he giveth thee strength to wrestle against the adverse powers. For as after his baptism he was tempted forty days, not that he was enabled to gain the victory before, but because he wished to do all things in due order and succession. So, thou likewise, though not daring before thy baptism to wrestle with the adversaries, yet after thou hast received the grace and art henceforth come confident in the armor of righteousness, and must then do battle and preach the gospel if thou wilt. So Jesus is baptized, doesn't change his abilities one iota, because he's already uh, the God man. And then immediately after baptism, in Mark it says immediately, because uh, St. Peter was a kind of an immediate kind of person, wasn't he? So it says, unlike the other um, Gospels, it's uh, uh, Mark is, is just, there's an intensity to Mark that's different. Immediately after the baptism, he goes out into the desert to be tempted, to show us that after baptism, it's time for work. There will be temptations after baptism. You might even have a bad day on your baptism. You might even, you know, have a fall on your baptism because the demons want you to associate that your baptism was not effectual, that you don't look at that, you're the same old terrible person, but you're not. And the demons will tempt you very much, perhaps on the day of your baptism, the week of your baptism. Don't pay any mind. Just struggle, that's all. What is the second baptism? 
wait a minute, do we believe two baptisms? Yes or no? Yeah, I guess we don't, because the creed says, I believe in one baptism. But we also believe in other baptisms, don't we? What's the other baptism we believe in? Confession. The baptism of repentance, right? Being, as it were, immersed in repentance. So, of course, it's not another baptism like the original baptism, but we refer to it as a baptism of repentance. So you mess up, what do you do? You come to confession, you beg God for help, and you will receive help. So just remember, when you're baptized, you're a soldier. You're a soldier, which means you, soldiers fight. You know, and you're going to be fighting. And you're going to be fighting with violence. Because it says the kingdom of heaven is being won by violence. What does that mean? What does that mean? We should all carry a 40 millimeter handgun? No. No? No. Maybe a little smaller? You commit warfare against your own sins. Yes, exactly. You, know, you can't just sit there and twiddle your thumbs and expect you to become perfect. Exactly. After baptism, we struggle, we fight, because this is a, a spiritual battle. One thing I like about reading a lot of times the lives of the saints, and especially uh, the Manathos, there are so many times when they attribute that it's the temptations of the devil. Like there was a, a priest who was always going up to a certain spot up in the rocks to celebrate liturgy. And he would be going up and he'd fall and he'd spill the wine. He had to go back down, get the wine, come up again. It might happen two or three times. Now us, we'd be going, we'd be mad because we're tripping and we say, you know, my gosh, liturgy's gonna be three hours late and I'm tired and I'm sweaty and everything. He was saying the demons were tempting him and he's not gonna give up. See? So it's a, it's a different way of looking at a different a, a way of looking at things. Remember, it was mentioned in the book uh, the uh, the young man the the young man the guru and other things. What was mentioned? Oh, uh, uh, it was a there was a similar story like that in which um, he he was in, involved with these gurus and of course later he went to Mount Athos and there was the same thing like the monks were around like I probably should not be around you I think we're being tempted here. I think we should no we shouldn't like literally think that you know if you if you drop a plate oh a demon made me do it don't don't be like that but a lot of times the demons are tempting you to become angry or to become distraught or whatever and um, or to a provocation a demon is not making that person in the car cut you off but when you're you're cut off then he wants to flare you to anger right and you should just chill you know push the brake a little bit, make the sign of the cross, say God bless you, and move on your way, right? So don't listen to the demon provoking you to become angry about somebody cutting you off. If you do that in Texas, my goodness, you're always angry then, huh? <laughs> always angry. I'm amazed though, it, it's interesting to me, I'm not a very good person, but I have noticed that people in confession will mention how they get so mad about driving and all this stuff. I hardly even, I, I, I it's very seldom that anything rattles me when I'm driving. Person, if a person you know you get sixth sense that they're coming up on you and maybe they're gonna do something, I just slow down a little or I look for them and then they cut me off and I, I don't know. I mean, I'm just fat, dumb, and happy. It's no big deal, you know. And for other people, it's like, oh gosh, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. It shouldn't be a big deal. Yeah, they jump and then that thing uh, rattles. And that glass might be 50 years old. So eventually it's just going to... Oh, it's center at the, top, at the bottom if it's 50 years old. Oh, yeah. Cause it, yeah. Did you know glass is a liquid? It's a super cool liquid. It's okay. You guys are holding yeah, just, the bad I just, I just hope it holds for now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you guys are protecting the rest of us. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Front lines. Front lines. This is... Okay, we're almost, we're almost at the end of this. So, Jesus Christ, this is uh, paragraph 14. Jesus Christ was the Son of God, yet he preached not the gospel before his baptism. He didn't do it, did he? He did it afterwards. St. John preached the gospel, then Christ was baptized, and then he started preaching. And that's to, because of the right order of things. Now, as far as you guys preaching, I don't recommend that you know you go get on a bicycle and go door to door. 
that some other people already have that gig, don't do that, okay? And, and be careful that certainly if someone talks to you and asks you questions, be willing to give an answer, but be careful that you don't get yourself in, in a pickle, that you don't get yourself where, you know, if somebody's really oily words and confuse you and such, you're not ready to be preaching to the world. I tell you that um, as a priest, there's a grace given to a, a sinful man to be a priest. And without that grace, we would be completely lost. Because pretty much every day as a priest, I always feel I'm overmatched, every time. And I don't want to ever not have that feeling that I'm overmatched, that it's too much for me. Because it is. And I think every priest, if you preach it, has any sense about him always feels that it's only by God's grace that we do anything. That we say anything intelligent, that we give any advice that's helpful, or or anything else. So we should be careful when you're baptized that you know you're not gonna go out and you know preach on a campus or something. You know like I there was a, this guy called Max. He he preached on the uh, Purdue campus. He was all around the Indiana and Ohio and such. He'd, he'd go places. And uh, he'd preach in the quadrangle, you know, between all the buildings. And uh, he was a fire and brimstone preacher. This is, this is in the 1980s, early 1980s. And uh, it was terrible hearing him say things and then everybody would be blaspheming and everything like that. You know, they'd always wanted to talk about, talk about marijuana, Max. And, you know, come on. Or he'd be talking about, sure, we should tell people not to have premarital sex, but not in the middle of the quadrant. How's that going to play with a bunch of college students? It's going to be a circus, right? But individually, we can talk to people about that, but not, not so we make it a mockery. So just be careful after your baptism not to be too, uh, yes, give an answer, but just be careful. Be careful. Um, if the master himself followed the right time and due order, are we as his servants to venture out of order? From that time, Jesus began to preach when the Holy Spirit had descended upon him in a bodily shape like a dove. Not that Jesus might see him first, for he knew him even before then, since of course he's God. But that John, who was baptizing him, might behold him. For he said, I knew him not, but he, he that sent me to baptize in water, he said unto me, Upon whomsoever thou shalt see the Spirit descending and abiding on him, it is he. If thou too hast unfeigned piety, the Holy Ghost will come. That's the old time way to say, right? The Holy Spirit will come down upon thee also, and the Father's voice sounds out from thee from on high. This is my son, but this is now... This, but this has been made my son, for the is belongs to him alone, because in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. To him belongs the is, since he is always the Son of God, but the is thou hast been made. So we're sons by what? Adoption. adoption. He's son by nature. We're sons by adoption. And our adoption service is baptism. Say the token line from the screw tape letters. What's that? Say the token line from the screw tape letters. In which he says, what he what he at uh, first he's in denial, but then he says, what he wants his servants to become sons. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. If, if you have never read the screw tape letters, it's really amazing. You can actually get it online. Um, it's amazing. It's a, it's a it's a masterpiece. It's a masterpiece. So make ready then the vessel of thy soul, that thou mayest become a son of God, an heir of God, a joint heir with Christ. If indeed thou art preparing thyself, that thou mayest receive. If thou art drawing nigh in faith, that thou mayest be made faithful. If of set purpose thou art putting off the old man, for all things whatsoever thou hast done shall be forgiven thee, whether it be fornication or adultery or any such form of licentiousness. And what can be a greater sin than to crucify Christ? And yet... Those who had crucified Christ during Pentecost, they were saying, what can we do? Repent and be baptized. And there were, what, 3,000 men that were baptized on that day? Some of them had been the ones who cried out to crucify Christ. So that really is pretty much to the end of this sermon.
I'm amazed that we got through the whole thing. I thought I was going to take, you know, three days per, per sermon. Uh, lecture four will be on the ten points of doctrine. It's very interesting. If you start to read it, I, uh, you might agree with me. I, I like it very much. So we'll go into that in great detail. So in the time that we have remaining, we have a couple minutes. Any questions about anything? So baptism. Water and spirit. The spirit part of baptism. What is the difference between that and chrismation? You know, I've kind of wondered about that too. I, I don't think it's personally that, in, that important to know. Baptism is, in our right, is the, is the uh, being baptized in the water and then being anointed with chrism. And when it's all done, you've been baptized in the water and the spirit. Okay. So I think that both are necessary. And it's less like which thread of a tapestry is the most important. All of them. You pull one, the whole thing comes apart. It, it begins, yeah, the whole thing will begin to unravel. So Don't we put the chrism in the water, too? No. No? No, we don't oh, do that. Okay. What is the oil that goes in the water? It's called the oil of gladness. Oh. Oil has always been used for uh, anointing, just, okay. just regular olive oil that's been blessed. And um, it's called the oil of gladness. Mm -hmm. And then we, what, after baptism, the chrism is a, it's a very special oil. I only have like two ounces of it. And it was prepared. The chrism we have was prepared in Moscow five years ago or 10 years ago or something. Mm -hmm. And they prepare it in these gigantic vats. It's very interesting because they do it during Holy, uh, Holy Week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I think. And then on Thursday, it's finished, or maybe Wednesday, it's finished. And they literally have wood fires, and they stir it continuously. There's a priest, vested, stirring it the entire time. So there's got to be a lot of priests, because obviously you can't stir it for that long. Mm -hmm. right? So uh, it has all kinds of things in it. It has uh, myrrh, and it has cassia, and it has cinnamon, and, and um, all kinds of other things. And it smells beautiful, and very sweet, and, and wonderful. And we believe, there's that word belief again, right? We know that the grace of the Holy Spirit has been imparted upon this oil to be equivalent to the laying on of hands. When the, God, when the apostles would lay on hands, at one point somebody said, we know of no other no Holy Spirit. We were baptized in the baptism of John. So they said, okay, that's cool. Let's lay hands on you so that you can have completion of the rite, right? So obviously we can't have the bishop go everywhere and lay hands on people. We have too many churches. Even in ancient times, there were too many churches. They probably had an even greater problem because you know, to travel 20 miles was difficult. So the priests were given chrism, which is basically the a blessing of the bishop to uh, lay hands. Sort of the extension of the bishop's hand. When a priest is ordained, he's given two things. He's given an antimens, assuming that he's going to a particular place to serve. It might that they already have an antimens, but then he's given chrism too. Because that chrism is his right, his blessing to conduct baptisms. I don't need to ask my bishop a blessing to baptize him. I've already been blessed to do it. I don't need to ask my bishop a blessing to preach. I've already been blessed to do it. Or to hear confessions. I've already been blessed to do it. Right. I mean, if I said, Vladika, can I marry such and such? He'd say, well, why are you asking me? You know, you know your parish, right? So I, I don't need a blessing for those things. Exceptional circumstances, of course we ask our bishop about it. Right? But um, otherwise, we're blessed to do it. So that's a good question, and I've wondered about it, but it's kind of, I don't think it's, um, in, it's not an important question. I think it's the kind of thing that can just get us kind of, uh, I'm not saying it's wrong to ask it, but, uh, you know, because I've asked it before. Yeah, it's a little too granular. It's like you'll be baptized in water and the Spirit. It'll be done. I'm bouncing off of what you just said. I'm just curious. What, what kind of things do you need the blessing of your bishop to do? Uh, sometimes, um, like if I baptize someone who was previously been received in a, in a, 
in, in a way that's not right, mm -hmm. then I would ask his blessing. He's given it so far every time I've asked. Uh, you, um, if a person is apostatized and I want to chrismate them because of their apostasy, they're an Orthodox Christian who, let's say, went away and went Hindu or something or did something and then is repented, I would ask his blessing, you know, explain to him. And uh, I, sh I shouldn't do that on my own authority. Uh, what other things? Oh, there's, there's always something that comes up where, oh, like if I wanted to do an exorcism, not the exorcisms of the, of the baptismal rite. Well, like creepy stuff happening in someone's house. Creepy stuff's happening, right? You know, like, you know, people are spitting green paint and stuff. <laughs> um, so if that's the case, then I would ask his blessing. And uh, if I did that, I'd hope he'd say to me, Father Seraph, are you crazy? Get seven priests to do it. You know, don't do it by yourself. Because that would be kind of a little bit ostentatious for me to think I could go you know, attack the demons. But um, I would ask a blessing to be part of an exorcism if that were the case. You know, there's other. I'm sure there's 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 always a reason to talk to your bishop about something. Mm -hmm. But you don't want to bug him about the stuff that he said for the seraphim. I already told you you could do that stuff. <laughs> you know, we don't want to just burn up his phone line. But by the way, I'm very proud of this uh, for our church, if you want to say, use that word. Our church, I have a phone. My bishop, I can call him on the phone anytime I want. He answers the phone. He says, oh, hi, Father Seraphim. And he knows my wife's name, et cetera, et cetera. You know? I mean, other jurisdictions, you've got to call the secretary. And the secretary will say, oh, you know, he might call you or whatever. You, you, they run interference. The chances of actually talking to somebody high and mighty in his super million dollar house, not a good chance. My bishop, I call him on the phone and he answers it. See? Or I send an email and he answers it. Right? So that's, that's the kind of, we're just a little country church. That's the way it should be, you know? That's the way it should be. What else? Have you ever been a part of an exorcism? People spitting green paint and stuff? No, I've never seen any spitting of green paint. I think that I have seen demon-possessed people. I just don't know which ones. Mm -hmm. I think I've had enough experiences that I've seen the activity of demons, but I haven't had the discernment to be absolutely aware, certain, that this is demons. So. Excuse me, I'm sorry, Mike. Oh, yeah. sorry. Oh. Oh. Sorry. Yeah. Some people, you know, you can read stuff from St. Paisios. He certainly experienced demons and other things, but he's a little bit different level than, than me. He wasn't even a priest. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. I was thinking about this during the sermon. Why can we eat pork now when they weren't allowed to eat pork? Okay, that's that's a good that's a good question. Uh, we can eat shrimp too. Shrimp was forbidden. You could have fish with scales. That was the only thing that was clean. All other seafood was unclean. Pork is unclean because he doesn't have a cloven hoof, right? Cows have a cloven hoof, right? And pork is unclean. Horse is unclean. It doesn't have a cloven hoof. Deer is unclean, right? Uh -oh. uh, <laughs> we can eat it though. Well, you, well, in the Old Testament it was. Yeah, no, I'm not. Right? But those were dietary laws. There were conduct that is in the Old Testament, but that has been superseded by the New Testament. But the moral laws of the Old Testament are not superseded. So sometimes people, because they just, they're just, I don't know, I, I guess intelligent people can say really stupid things. They equate that we eat shrimp, well if we can eat shrimp then why is homosexuality still an abomination? They're not the same thing. One is a moral law, the other is was a dietary law because the people were led along slowly to be able to uh, become pious. Now we don't need a dietary law about shrimp or about pork. 
to correct my understanding that I've always had about this is that it was kind of a hedge deal to say that this people were set apart to God. This is why it's yeah, that was that was a big part of it. That the Jews had to be different from the other tribes. So they were different in their moral conduct, for their sexual conduct was completely different than the rest of the pagan world, completely different. It was revolutionary how they were about the idea that, uh, that there was adultery was a sin and that certain perverse practices were a sin. That wasn't. The pagans did everything. And also the pagans ate everything. And the Jews didn't, so it separated them. Now we're separated in a different way. We're separated, we're, we're a peculiar people, right? St. Peter says he separated us as a peculiar people. Some of us are more peculiar than others, but we're a peculiar people set apart, right? So we're set apart in a spiritual way, and not whether or not you eat pork. You can eat pork if you want. I'm also pretty sure that Jesus told it was Peter in a vision. It was Court in Acts. Yeah, yeah. All the all the things I oh I won't eat anything unclean. It says if I say it's clean, it's clean. <laughs> right? That was the bringing in of the Gentiles. Mm-hmm. So if you want to eat pork, go ahead and eat pork. Possum, eat possum if you want. Mm-hmm. Just a squirrel. Many kids are doing that. Maybe not. <laughs> Rattlesnake. I don't care. Mm-hmm. Can I? Uh, it's kind of related to what I was thinking of earlier. Whenever you told the story about that man that went out into the wilderness to figure out the meaning of that verse, uh, you know, um, this uh, all of the law is supposed to point to Christ, right? And you know, I look at um, uh, commands in the law, like you know, don't eat the nighthawk, the owl, or the sparrow. And it's like I wonder how how I can get from there to Christ. You know, the connection's there, but I might have to meditate on that for a long while. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, you could, um, but I also think that we have much more powerful things just in the New Testament to read, right? Right. Uh, if you're a great scholar and stuff, you could probably make all these connections. But, mm-hmm. uh, because there's all kinds of typology and everything that points to Christ in the Old Testament. We should know some of the major ones, you know, baptism by the Red Sea and Saint and Moses hitting the waters with a with a rod and stuff like that. Victory songs, all that kind of stuff. The you know the the, the serpent that was being raised up. Mm-hmm. Christ delights in referring to himself in ways that are just not regular, right? He's the Samaritan in, in a parable. The Samaritan was the good guy. That must have made the Jews so mad. Right? Because the Samaritans were dogs to them. Anti-hero. Yeah. And, of course, and then the serpent. If you look at the serpent, then you hear it from a snake bite. All right. So I think Father Nick is about to clear the room here. So I arrive too late. I think we're just about done. Any other questions? Maybe Father Nicholas. So do I, do, do, I, do, I get, do I get a recap from somebody then? <laughs> you have to watch the video. <sighs> no one remembers enough to... Go ahead, recap to him. Tell him what we talked about. We talked about baptism. <laughs> uh, a little more than that. <laughs> Dang it. A little more than that. Be careful how we're preaching. Maybe it's our example of the preachers for Okay. Also, the symbolism behind baptism, death and resurrection, entrance into a new life. Mm-hmm. Uh, some in notes in particular for us, things like Christian baptism is making a substantive change to a person, whereas St. John the Forerunner's baptism that he was giving to people was solely for the remission of sins. Uh, after we're baptized, we should be living a vigorous life. Baptism is necessarily a public event. It's not something you do hidden away. Um, there's some Old Testament symbols of baptism. I think the one that we discussed here in class was the Israelites crossing the Red River. Red Sea. The Red Sea. The Red River is to go in I'm Oklahoma. thinking. Uh, I'm still thinking. <laughs> of the Red Sea. Correct. Yeah. Thank you for the correction. And then, uh, if you cross the Red River, make sure you're going south. <laughs> yeah, because you want to get away from the Egyptians. <laughs> and then I also think we uh, 
there was a comment, I think Father said this, that baptism is the in the Old Testament and the beginning of the New. Mm -hmm. That's what I have here in my notes. Yeah, okay. So did you keep track of how many rants did I do this time? I'm trying to keep them, you know, more control. Should we, should, one we two? A, should we have a count? A rant count? Maybe, maybe two rants. I can give you a chalkboard to put up in here. Yeah, maybe two, <laughs> two rants. I'll grab my abacus. But I, I, also, I will continue to rant about this idea. This is very important. We live in an age that's so amoral, so uh, uh, a, uh, dogmatic, so just confused. And it's creeping into the church. You can see hierarchs talking about it. So what's really important is we do things the way that's been handed down to us because if you do things the, a different way, you will change your theology. Well, people will say, oh, you know, you're slave to this and you're just, you know, all you care about is this legalistic stuff. No, that's them talking because they don't know what they're talking about. We baptize with three immersions because that's what we were taught. We don't do it a different way. If there's a, there are creeping into the church poor forms of baptism. It's been going on now for a couple hundred years. And it is changing the way people think about baptism. The theology is getting poorer. And there are people that don't even understand baptism and yet they preach about it with orthodox vestments on because we've had so long that we've had this bad practices that have come into the church. So we're going to do it the right way. I'll only receive people by baptism. If you have bad liturgical practices that morphs into or is aided by uh, bad theology. It's similar to how we pray, right? It's like if we if we do what is handed down to us, then we start to acquire the spirit of those who handed it down. Exactly. Whereas if we think up ourselves what we're going to do, then we're just in reinforcing our own spirit, which is probably not the right one. So like when I ask you a question, I've done this before, why should we fast? I think the perfect answer is because the church tells us to fast. Now, there's other good answers, but that's enough. That should be enough for us. The church says fast, we fast out of obedience. That's all you need to know, really. People can save their souls by saying, I'm going to just live the way the church told me to live because it's the right way to live. Now, there's lots of good, logical, um, theologically precise reasons why we fast, but that's the most important one. That's the most important one. It's good enough for Christ. It's good enough for me. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So make sure that you are careful that you're not, uh, you don't get lazy. You don't get lazy with your prayers. You don't get lazy with coming to church, etc. It, it will weaken you, and you don't might not know what you are in 10 years. It's really easy right now. 10 years from now, it's not going to be easy. And there's going to be this powerful delusion that's just getting stronger and stronger in the world. What makes you think that you're not going to be deluded? I don't think you should be saying, oh, well, I will never. I think you should be struggling to follow the the way the church lives. And don't let anybody be telling you, oh, that's legalistic, or oh, you're just being, you know, you're about rights, you're about uh, traditions of men and everything else. No, this is the traditions of the Holy Spirit. So the reason priests dress a certain way is because it's our tradition. The reason why we baptize a certain way, it's our tradition. The reason why we make the sign of the cross, it's our tradition. And we do those things because this is, this is God-breathed, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And if we start cutting corners, and baptism is a place where it's really being cut, especially receiving people, because so many people are being received now by chrismation, and they're being told because you're already baptized, which is a flat-out heresy. There is no baptism outside of the church. Now, there are reasons to receive somebody by chrismation. I personally think they've all passed. Well, not all of them. There's a 92-year-old woman that might come into the church and she'll be chrismated. Because how are you going to get her in a fight, right? So there are, there's economy. Economy. But a real economy. Instead of, yeah. instead of just seeing, now it's not economy. It's like, I can't baptize you. I'm forbidden to baptize you because you've already been baptized, and that would be a sin because we believe in one baptism. See? It's morphed into a heresy. And I won't be any part of it. 
Father, you keep reminding me of just this image that I heard in a sermon once. It's so simple, but it helps me that if you're hiking and you step off the trail and go in what you think is a good direction, pretty soon you could be miles away from where you're supposed to be heading. It's so simple, but you know, it's good. It, it's helpful for me to remember that. I had that conversation with my dad essentially this morning. Um, we got an email about my son's baseball, and there's like practice at noon on Sundays. I said, oh, well, so I'm not going to go to that one. My dad lost it. got mad. And I looked at my dad, and I said, Dad, there's a .001% chance my son will become a professional baseball player. There is a 110% chance he's going to stand before God today. Mm-hmm. It's like in the priorities. You don't like it? Sorry. What'd he say? He just <laughs> go to church. I'm like, I need to see later. You made your point, though. <laughs> so it's not really an argument that you made against that. Even if your math was a little creative, I agree. <laughs> All right, we got anything else to talk about? I do want to ask you something after we're done. Is that it? Father Nicholas, any questions? Huh? No? I feel I was jipped, honestly. I mean, the stuff you said you talked about couldn't have lasted that whole time. Uh, uh, we haven't talked about all of the stuff. What did we all say? We, we learned we can eat pork now. And <laughs> shrimp. <laughs> See, this is important. <laughs> we talked about how God will forgive anything if we repent. Anything, right. even crucifying. Him. Because at the Pentecost, people who had cried out, crucify him, said, now what do we do? Repent and be baptized. Repent and be baptized. And we also talked about something else related to that. We live in an age that's so strange, people have done strange things. Mm-hmm. Our childhood... Our, our young adulthood in general, aggregate, has been weirder than our grandparents, you know? And so those kinds of things leave a mark on us. They won't mark our soul, but they, they, they leave wounds. And it's harder for people to believe that they're saved now, I think, because they've gone through so many things. Imagine the people that are going through the really weird stuff in the, in the alphabet soup. And then they come to their senses, but they've done bizarre things, including, you know, carved up their body, and they are going to have trouble when they come to repentance, because they're going to say, I, I've ruined myself. They have not ruined themselves. There is no sin that God will not forgive. And I, and I want you to be aware that no matter what your past, you might have repercussions from your past. You might have weaknesses because of your past. But those are just those are just temporary human problems. Everybody can be saved. And that's important. That's really important. Best the, news ever. That is the best news ever. And it's really important because in our day there's there's so much confusion and there's so much there's so much brokenness. I think people are much more broken than when I was a kid. And much more broken than you know when my children, when my parents were kids. It's just getting worse, and all this stuff that's happening make people with the drugs and with the strange sexual stuff and with so many other things and so many uh, morphing Christianity into some sort of weird thing that people think is Christian, and then they come out of that. But you still got the effects of those things, right? I mean, you're forgiven of that, but you still have weaknesses because of that. And this is where we, if we live a Christian life, we struggle, then we have that anointing of the Holy Spirit. Actually, I could have talked about that from uh, from St. Paul's uh, letter today. You know, we have that certainty because God is within us. But sometimes we don't feel God because the other stuff that happened to us, it overwhelms us. I just want to, you know, I'll never stop talking about that because I think this is a different age. If I was 100 years ago, I wouldn't be talking in the same way because there wouldn't be this insanity that people are uh, are accepting or believing around, right? 
but now we have insanity, much more than any other age. You know, I mean, in the old Roman age, there was paganism. They were doing bizarre things, mm -hmm. right? But the Christians were coming out of that. They were leaving that. And there was pagan, and there was Christian. Once in a while, people got confused. St. Paul kind of explained some things to the Corinthians. But pretty much pagan and Christian, and there was the difference. Now there are people that say they're Christian and are pagan. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's very confusing. Mm -hmm. and people have been indoctrinated in that, in that stuff. So if you've had any of those problems before, you can be saved. But you just have to be intense. You have to live intensely. All right, anybody want a last word? We should ask Father Nicholas to give a speech. A speech. Yeah, he's just looking at his cell phone. He's just, oh boy. I should, I should talk about can people who look at their cell phone during catechesis be saved? <laughs> What? <laughs> What's that? So I'm definitely not safe. <laughs> <laughs> All right.